This is lecture 16 on the sampling distribution of a proportion. I'll remind you that in lecture 1 and the lectures that followed, we talked about populations, we talked about variables, a, quantity, a question you could ask about each individual, and we talked about parameters that summarize those, like the average in proportion. Then we talked about samples that you could take from the population, and statistics, which summarized the same variables in the sample instead of in the population. We went into great depth about these, uh, but then we um, switched to probability and started talking about uh, random variables. Now we're going to put these all together into one big and lovely package. Uh, so let's start with a population, let's say adult Americans, and let's start with a binary variable, binary categorical variable, whether they believe in God. Okay, That's a pretty straightforward variable. There's really only one parameter of any interest, the population proportion, which we'll call P. Uh, and I should point out that uh, this violates our convention. We had said that parameters uh, should be referred to by Greek letters. So it should be some letter like theta or something, which occasional books do, but almost everyone uses P for proportion, violating that convention. That's life. Uh, so let's make this precise. Let's suppose that 82% of Americans believe in God. So our proportion P in that case would be 0.82. Now I want to take, imagine a sample of adult Americans and I want to ask if they believe in God. Uh, so now we would be interested in a statistic, which is the sample proportion. We're going to write the sample proportion as a P with a hat over it. So the hat indicates that we're in the sample. The lack of a hat indicates we're in the population. Um, so P hat is the proportion of the sample who believe in God. So that's the number divided by 400 in our case. Okay, so you would expect that p hat would be pretty close to 0.82, but it's not the same, right? The proportion in any one sample may differ higher or lower than 0.82. We'd like to know what are reasonable things to expect from a sample proportion if you know the population proportion, right? That is a pretty good question to ask once we've answered that, we can work backwards and ask, if I see a particular sample proportion, what are reasonable population proportions that might have led to it? That's the long-range goal. So for now, we imagine that we fixed that population proportion P at 0.82. We fixed the sample size at n equals 400. Uh, and now we want to think about taking a random sample as a process that's repeatable with a different outcome each time, and if we compute p hat, then that outcome is a number, the number p hat, and therefore we get a random variable. This is one of the biggest ideas in the course. We've talked about picking an individual from a population, measuring something numerical, and that gives you a random variable, but here we're taking a whole sample from the population measuring a statistic, p hat, and calling that a random variable. So to remind you that it's a random variable, I'm going to call it capital p hat. So when I'm thinking about taking many different samples and computing p hat for each one and looking at the distribution, I'll use a capital p hat. We call that the sampling distribution, and I want to imagine what that histogram would look like, what are reasonable and unlikely values for p hat. There's really a complete answer to that equation, it, question under favorable circumstances. So under favorable circumstances I can tell you three things. The first is that the mean of the sampling distribution p hat is p. That may sound like a mysterious wash of symbols, but in fact it makes perfect sense. Why? Because if you took a sample of 400 out of this population where 82% believe in God, you asked them how many believed in God, you'd expect around 82% would. 
sometimes more, sometimes less, but on average, 82% of each sample would believe in God. So the average p hat is equal to p. Less obvious is that the standard deviation of capital P hat, sigma sub p hat, is equal to the square root of p times 1 minus p over n, n is 400 is the sample size. It's not a formula what you would have guessed, but I'll say two interesting things about it. First of all, not interesting maybe, I'll say that that the convention is when you talk about the standard deviation of a sampling distribution, that is if you're looking how it varies as you go from sample to sample, you refer to it as standard error. Um, but the two interesting things are first you see that n, the sample size, is in the denominator. So that tells you the bigger n is, the smaller the standard deviation is. And that you could have guessed. Because of course, if you ask one or two or three people, it wouldn't be that surprising to have all of them, a hundred percent, say they believe in God. And it wouldn't be that surprising to have none of them say they believe in God. So for when n is small, you expect a very large variation in the reasonable values. But when n is large, if you ask thousands of people, you'd expect the proportion would be pretty close, usually, to the population proportion of 82%. So that's reflected in the fact that as n gets bigger, sigma gets smaller. The other subtler thing is that its dependence on p looks kind of complicated, but the effect of multiplying p times 1 minus p and then taking the square root means that it doesn't vary much as you vary p. Different values of p end up having pretty similar values for the standard deviation sigma, except they get smaller if p is very close to zero or 100%. That's a fact we'll rely on later. It's not very sensitive to p. The third fact is that p hat will have a normal distribution if n is big enough. These three things together, normal distribution plus telling you the mean and standard deviation, we learned in the last lecture tell you everything about the variable. Mm -hmm. So this means that under these favorable circumstances, we'll be able to predict everything you'd want to know about what is likely and unlikely to happen when you take that sample and compute p hat. But there were three assumptions. When I said under favorable circumstances, there were three assumptions needed to mathematically derive those facts. The assumptions in the abstract are very strong and are almost never true in real life. However, and this is going to be a constant refrain in statistics from here on in, one learns in real life that there are conditions which in practice mean that it is close enough to satisfying the theoretical assumption. We are going to turn those rules, those sort of in principle, vague ideas about what's good enough into rules of thumb. Rule of thumb will be, for us, a fairly precise condition to check that says it's good enough that we can go ahead and do our calculations. I want to alert you to a kind of complicated dodge for the purposes of teaching. In When you actually do statistics, it is an extremely important thing to understand that the conclusions are only as good as the degree to which you satisfy the assumptions. So it's very important to me that you walk out of here with a deep-seated recognition that you need to look at the assumptions and decide how well they are met when you do calculations and to use that knowledge to assess your calculations. If the assumptions aren't very plausible, if you don't feel like they've been really close to being met, you should treat your calculations at least with great suspicion. That process is more art than science. It's a matter of judgment. It's a matter of understanding your data, understanding how strong you need your conclusions to be, and is not something that I can teach in a class. So what I can do to prepare you is to practice checking these assumptions. I've written them as precise rules of thumb so you can just decide yes or no it meets the assumption rather than having fuzzy decisions to make. 
and we will check the assumptions pretty much every time we do a problem. In practice, whether the assumptions are met or not, we will go ahead and do the calculations because I want you to practice both checking assumptions and doing calculations. In real life, nuanced decisions need to be made and we will not practice those. All right, no further ado, I will tell you the three assumptions. The first assumption is that the sample is a simple random sample. That's the basis of everything. Um, none of these calculations make sense if it's not. You might reasonably ask what happens in real life if it's not. Well, there are two answers. If it's a random sample, but not a simple random sample, then you just have to adjust these calculations. They're more cal complicated calculations. You look them up in books. You find them in software. It's a little more work, but everything works fine. As I said, random samples are as good as simple random samples, just a little more complicated. On the other hand, um, much more commonly, you will have something which isn't really a random sample at all. Then, you have a judgment to make. And the way you make the judgment, as we've practiced, is to think about sampling biases. If it is not a random sample, not a simple random sample, but the uh, non-randomness does not introduce any apparent bias, it seems to be unrelated to the variables you're considering, then most people will go ahead and assume that it's a simple random sample. Uh, but if you can think of possible sources of bias, and you need to be very thinking very broadly here, which is why we practiced that skill, then you can decide whether those are enough of a concern that you shouldn't be taking these conclusions seriously at all, or perhaps you should treat them with a little bit of caution, or they're not a concern at all. So for us, checking it's a simple random sample is pretty much going to be checking that the question tells you. In real life, you know how the data has been gathered, and then you have a complicated decision about whether that's close enough to a simple random sample. Okay, for B, one of the things we assumed in making that calculation was that the, uh, each successive individual chosen for the sample was independent of the others. This gets back to problems that we did with decks of cards and the birthday problem and things like that. And we noticed that if you draw cards from a deck and replace them each time, everything is independent, the calculations are very simple. If you draw cards from a deck in a normal fashion, where each time you take off a card you don't replace it, then that subtly changes the makeup of the deck and changes the probabilities and the calculations are more complicated. Uh, so we, that's uh, the process of sampling. Taking a sample from a population is exactly like the process of taking a hand from a deck of cards. You randomly, you shuffle the deck so it's random and you draw successive cards. So sampling, the way it's normally done, is like drawing cards from a deck. It's done without replacement. The actual calculations that we do assume that we're doing sampling with replacement. So that assumption isn't generally correct, but we saw in calculations that when the deck had 52 cards, pulling one card out of it didn't change the probabilities very much. Um, even more so, with the kind of populations we'll deal with, the individuals you pull out from the sample don't change the makeup of the population noticeably. So for a large population, the distinction doesn't matter. That is all to say that our second assumption is the large population assumption. In order to assume independence, so in order to do the calculation that we gave for the standard deviation, you need the population to be at least 20 times the size of the sample. So the number of things in the population should be 20 times the number of things in the sample. If it's not, and this will be very rare, there's a fix to the standard deviation formula you can do, and it still works fine. Finally, I said that the larger n is, the closer p hat's distribution is to a normal distribution. It turns out this happens faster if p is close to 0.5, and it takes longer if p is close to 0 or 1. So 
the rule of thumb that combines those facts together says is called the rule of 15. You will have to remember the large population assumption and the rule of 15. The rule of 15 says you can assume that the distribution is normal if the numbers n times p and n times 1 minus p are both at least 15. In other circumstances, that number 15 will change a little. So this is only in this one case of a binary categorical variable. <clears throat> Let's see how all this works in an example. So again, 82% of adult Americans believe in God, and you're taking a simple random sample of 400 adults, adult Americans, and asking if they believe in God. So we want to know what are the mean and standard deviation of p hat, the proportion in the sample who believe in God. We'd also like to know more concretely what's the chance that we would get fewer than 80% in the sample believing in God. What's the chance we'd get between 80 and 90? All right, the first assumption is that it's a simple random sample. It says in the problem we took a simple random sample, so that assumption is met. In general, when you check that assumption, if the question says it is, it is. If the question doesn't say, you don't know. If the question describes the sampling method, you can decide whether or not it's random. It's a simple random sample, but that will be fairly unusual. Since it's a simple random sample, then the mean of p hat is going to be p, which we said was 0.82. Second assumption is the large population assumption. We need there to be more than 400, which is the sample size, times 20, so we need there to be more than 8,000 adult Americans. The problem doesn't say how many adult Americans there are, but that's okay, because everybody knows that there's more than 8,000 adult Americans, right? How many are there? I don't know. 150, 200 million, something like that, but it's more than 8,000, so this is met. That process is very important because that's typical. We will rarely actually know what the population is. Usually, it will be obvious that the population is bigger than that, than that number, 20 times the sample size, but not always. So I will want to see that you understand that it's 20 times the sample size, that you can compute that, in this case, get the number 8,000, and then if it's obvious to you that the population is bigger than 8,000, you can say met. If you aren't sure, say I don't know. If it's obvious to you it's not met, you can say that as well. Since the large population assumption is readily met, we can compute the standard deviation with that formula. We multiply p times 1 minus p. In practice, I found, find 1 minus p easier to do in my head. I'm more likely to make a stake, mistake if I'm trying to type in parentheses in there than if I just do it in my head. 1 minus 0.82 is 0.18. So I multiply 0.82 times 0.18, I divide by 400, and then I take the square root. And if you're doing this in Excel, which is a good idea, because we'll be using this calculation later on, the Excel function for square root is SQRT. So you would do equals SQRT open parentheses 0.82 times open parentheses, 1 minus 0.82, close parentheses, slash 400, close parentheses. We'll do an example in a minute, minute or two using this. We get that the standard deviation is 1.92%. So this is pretty typical. Our mu is always going to be between 0 and 1 because it's a proportion. Our standard deviation will vary from 1 to 5 or 6% depending mostly on the size of the sample. Finally, we check the normality assumption, which is the rule of 15. So we multiply the sample size n times p, 400 times 0.82 is 328, which is more than 15. We also multiply n times 1 minus p, 400 times 0.18 is 72, which is also more than 15. So we easily meet the rule of 15. We need both of those to be true. Um, and a point which will come up later on, those numbers, 328 and 72, are the average number of yes and no answers that you'd expect to see in your sample.
All right, now that we know it's a normal distribution and we know it's mean and standard deviation, we can calculate probabilities. So for example, to find the probability that we would get less than 80% uh, who believe in God in our sample, we would compute probability that capital P hat is less than 0.8, and that's a norm dist calculation. Less than a certain value is just plain norm dist. The first element is 0.8, the second entry is 0.82, and the third entry is the standard deviation. And notice I've left it as a formula rather than uh, putting in the approximate value. And the fourth entry is one. I'm gonna go through this calculation. The reason I left that formula in there is because norm dist can be very sensitive to the standard deviation. And if you are not careful, and if you round your standard deviation too much, you can get a significantly different answer. In particular, you can get an answer that I don't recognize as correct because you've rounded so much it looks wrong. The simplest way to avoid this, and a good habit, is to just type in the exact formula for the standard deviation. So let me show you how that goes. Let's remember the numbers 0 0.82, 400, and 0.8. And now I'm going to go to Excel. And here's my N and P. My mean is just P. So somewhat foolishly, I'm just going to type that, type the formula in there. I'm certainly not necessary. My standard deviation is the square root, open parentheses, of P, which is B2, times open parentheses, 1 minus P, divided by M. Okay, I'm going to leave that there for a second. And the reason I've done it this way, where I've used only cell references, is the next time I have a problem, I can just change n and change p, and I will still have the correct mean and standard deviation. So there's my standard deviation as advertised, 1.92. But now that I've computed it exactly, or as exactly as Excel can, then I can refer to that in my probability, in my probability calculations, and I don't need to round it off. So we were computing equals norm dist very slow computer, open parentheses, 0.8, and then everything else I can get by clicking the mean, comma, the standard deviation, comma, 1. That's the ritualistic 1. I close up the parentheses. I'll pause just a moment. If you need more time, you can stop the tape and look through. And there's my calculation, 14.89%. Let's go back to this calculation, 14.89% or 14.9 to three decimal places. And then I'm just going to go down to the next example without uh, going through the, my usual slide method. Between 80 and 90% is the probability that p hat is greater than 0.8 and less than 0.9, which is norm dist of the bigger minus norm dist of the smaller. And let me just quickly show you how easily we can do that equals norm dist of 0.9, comma mean, comma standard deviation, comma 1, minus norm dist of 0.8, comma mean, comma standard deviation, comma 1. And there's the formula, and it's 85.1%. Okay, let's go back to uh, slide mode. That's what calculations look like. So what we did here, it's the conceptual part of this is subtle, and I want to keep hammering it home, although 
you're doing fine if you can just get through the calculations for now and let the conceptual stuff percolate, but I do want you to be thinking about it, um, is in that situation, 82% of your population says answers yes to this question. You're going to take a sample of 400. You want to know what kind of proportion would we expect to see in the sample? And the answer is, well, it's going to be a normal distribution with a mean of 0.82 and a standard deviation of 1.9%. So, about two-thirds of the time, it'll be, that sigma is about 2%, so about two-thirds of the time, it'll be between 80 and 84%. 95% of the time, it'll be between 78 and 86%. You have a very good idea of what are reasonable and unreasonable values for p hat now. Let's do another picture. Oh, right. The mean is 0.82, the standard deviation is 0.019. Said that in detail. Here's another example of a little bit different color. Let's say you know the answer to 75% of the questions your philosophy professor might ask. You have, you know 75% of the material. Let's view the 50 questions on the test as a simple random sample of all the questions that your professor might ask. What are the mean and standard deviation of the proportion that you'll get right? In other words, your grade on the test, right? If you know 75% of the material, you might hit it lucky, and every question is from the stuff that you know, and you'll get 100%. Or you might hit it unlucky and get a terrible grade. You'd guess, on average, you'll get around the 75%. We can answer that and we can ask probability of getting an A, which is over 90%, or a B, between 80 and 90, or a C, and so on. Is it a simple random sample? Yes. It's a funny thing, but we're viewing it as a simple random sample. We're saying, however he makes up those questions, it behaves like a simple random sample. Large population. We would need there to be at least 20 times the sample size which is to say a thousand possible questions. What is a set of possible questions? It's very fuzzy, but it's surely more than a thousand. Infinitely many questions a philosophy professor might ask. And finally, the rule of 15, we check that n, which is 50, times p, which is 75%, is 37.5 is more than 15, so that's met. Then we check that n, which is 50, times 1 minus p, which is 0.25. Ooh, that's 12.5, which is less than 50. So we fail the rule of 50. What do we do? We go ahead and compute it anyway and treat the results with some skepticism. There are techniques that you can use when the normality assumption fails. They're called non-parametric tests for kind of obscure reasons. Uh, and those are okay to use. Most people, if you come close to meeting the uh, rule of 15, will go ahead and use this calculation. And as long as it doesn't come out any kind of, as long as it's not close or an issue of an exact precise calculation, they'll assume it's all right. Okay, so we checked the assumptions. Even though we didn't meet them all, we're going to go ahead and do the calculations. So whether you meet them or not, you always do the calculations. That's an artificial thing for the purpose of the class. The easy one, the mean, is 0.75, which is p. The standard deviation is the square root of 0.75 times 0.25 times divided by 50, which is 6.12. How did I do that? On the Excel spreadsheet that I just showed you, I changed 400 to 50. I changed 0.82 to 0.75 and all my answers popped right out. Okay, and remember we wanted to ask these three probabilities, A, B, and C, and we're going to use the fact that B hat is normal and has a mean of 0.75 and a standard deviation of 6.12%. So the probability that P is greater than 0.9 because it's greater than 0.9, we have a lower bound but not an upper, we do 1 minus norm dist, 
we put in 0.9, we put in 0.75, and we put in the 0.0612, but we put it in exactly. And we find that it's a very small number, 0.715%. Does that seem reasonable? Well, the mean is 0.75, the standard deviation is about 0.06, so 0.9 is about two and a half standard deviations above the mean. If there were two standard deviations, we'd expect to see the probability of being bigger than it at about two and a half percent. So this is well above that, so it's going to be pretty small. A little under one percent sounds right. Between 0.8 and 0.9, we do norm dis to 0.9, minus norm dis to 0.8, and it works out to 20 percent. Again, does that sound reasonable? 0.8 is a little bit more than one standard deviation below the mean. 0.9 is very high up, so we're low, I'm sorry, is 0.8 is a little bit less than one standard deviation above the mean, and then we're going up to 0.9, which is very high, so a reasonable approximation would be the probability of being more than one standard deviation above the mean, which is about a sixth. This is a little bit more than a sixth. And between 0.7 and 0.8, I'll leave you to do this calculation yourself, 58.6%. And again, that's going from about one standard deviation below the mean to about one standard deviation above the mean, a little bit less. So it's a little bit less than two-thirds. Perfect. So what we've just seen an example of is a population and a variable and we are imagining taking a simple random sample and computing some statistic. In this case, it was the proportion. Next lecture, it will be the mean. Um, we're taking a sample, computing a statistic. Each time you do this, you get a different answer. So we're thinking of that as a random variable. Um, the distribution of that random variable is called the sampling distribution. We want to know its mean and standard deviation. Three things that we will want to have different names for uh, because there are several different distributions and random variables to talk about. The population distribution is the values of the actual variable. So in this case the variable is yes or no, so the 80, there's 82% of all Americans believe in God, 18% don't. You've described the population then. Uh, the data distribution is the values of the variable in your sample. Maybe you had 320 yes answers and 80 no. That's what happens in one particular sample. But then the sampling distribution is the different values of the statistic in different samples. So there's three levels we're looking at. Inside the sample, inside the population, and this hybrid or even higher thing where we're looking at inside the set of all possible samples in the population. A lot of big ideas. Here's what you need to know. You should know what we mean by the sampling of distri distribution of p-hat and what it represents. You should be able to calculate the mean and standard deviation of p-hat. That's easy. The mean is p. The standard deviation is the square root of p times 1 minus p over n. You should be able to check the independence large population assumption and know what it tells you. It tells you that the standard deviation formula is correct. You should know how to check the normality rule, which is the rule of 15. n times p, n times 1 minus p are both at least 15. And what it tells you, it tells you that you can use norm dist. Of course, you should be able, I didn't put it down, to check whether something is a simple random sample. And finally, and this is really just something from lecture 15, you should be able to calculate the probabilities of p hat using norm dist. That's all for this lecture. I just want to point out that we found something that is clearly interesting and useful. What we did in probability allows us to answer a very important question about populations and samples. If 82% of Americans believe this, I can now predict with great accuracy what will happen if I take a sample and compute the sample uh, proportion p hat.
that is going to prove very important when we try and reverse that process and use what we got in the sample to infer reasonable values for the parameter.